All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. And thank you for attending our second event as part of the West Lecture and Visiting Poets and Writers series at Brevard College. I would like to thank the Humanities Division and English Program at Brevard College for their support of this series and all of you for attending this evening. My name is Elise Stencil and I'm an Assistant Professor of English at Brevard College. Tonight, we virtually welcome visiting poets Simone Savannah and S. Brooke Korfman. First, Savannah and Korfman will read from their work. Then we will have time for a Q&A session. As a matter of courtesy, please ensure that your microphone is off for the duration of the reading, and you can turn off video during the reading if you wish. During the Q&A session, please type in your question into the chat. If you wish to read your question aloud, you may raise your hand and unmute. Now, I would like to introduce Caroline Hoy, a junior majoring in environmental studies and minoring in creative writing, who will be introducing Simone Savannah. So Caroline, you can take it away from the Clarion office. Hmm. They might be having trouble connecting. No, we cannot hear you. Always something on Zoom. <laughs> All right, so because Clarion is having some technical difficulties from their office, we're gonna switch things up <laughs> a little bit um, just to give um, uh, Caroline, who's over at the Clarion office. Um, many of our students are, are very busy and they're currently doing layout for the student newspaper <laughs> while attending <laughs> a poetry reading, uh, which is wonderful. I'm glad they can do that. Um, but we're going to go ahead and switch up the order then, um, just to make sure we stay within our, our time. So if that's okay, Sam, <laughs> if you don't mind switching it up. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce um, our reader, um, S. Brooke Korfman, who will now be reading first this evening. So... Korfman will be visiting my poetry writing class soon, and I am delighted that my students will have the opportunity to listen to them read while we are just beginning to read and discuss their work. Um, they're actually doing the opposite approach for uh, Simone Savannah's collection, so I'm excited to see these first impressions that they have of Korfman's work. Like so many connections in the literary world, my first encounter with Korfman and their poetry was through a contest. We were finalists for the same book prize and when their collection Luxury Blue, Lux Luxury Blue Lace was selected by Richard Sykin as the winner, I eagerly grabbed a copy and I did what I love to do. I reviewed it. And my students here all know they're writing book reviews and doing interviews right now and they are very, integral part of being part of literary community. In the review published in, by Quarterly West, I wrote about how Korfman evades conclusions and binaries in their work. Everything is always in between. I'll reproduce a few lines from the review here. Quote, luxury blue lace asks questions and seeks possibilities without ever attempting to define or capture a singular answer. Such productive speculation generates a series of ifs that keep gender and the body in flux, never definitive. With deft use of the sequence, the prose poem, and the couplet, Korfman critically examines these contentious and often limiting categories in the nonlinear narrative lyric. In their latest collection, My Daily Actions or The Meteorites, which I have here, and show our books. <laughs> but that's why we have here. Let's make sure everyone is muted. Great. Okay. In their latest collection, My Daily Actions or the Meteorites, named a 2020 New York Times Best Poetry Collection, Korfman returns to the prose poem and lyric, playing the possibilities of the open field. In response to Korfman's work, my students have been or will be writing prose poems, 
using oracle decks and paper fortune tellers to write poems, discovering erasure and collage, and trying out fragmentation in their own work. I look forward to the possibilities that will unfold for them too. Once again, I am delighted to virtually welcome S. Brooke Korfman to Brevard College. Um, thank you, Elise, for that introduction um, and everybody for being here. Uh, yeah, I'm excited also to see how the different approaches um, work. I feel like um, I'm excited that Simone and I are reading together at this intersection because I feel like normally, yeah, you read the book and then the person comes for the reading. That's sort of how I've always thought about it. But I love this. You get to kind of hear me first for this for my new book, which I feel like that's, um, it does something to it maybe a little bit differently. Um, okay, I took notes during that because I wanted to say things. So one, uh, I just wanted to say also, it's a special pleasure for me to be here because the review that Elise wrote of my first book, um, I mean, you know, reviews are this kind of strange thing in which now a full review, like an actual written published review is like kind of rare. Um, because there's social media and there's Twitter and there's all these other ways in which people promote and talk about books, which is great. Um, but there is something that is like both important uh, kind of historically and like institutionally about the review um, and also really kind of lovely that this other person spends this extended time that's like not really in conversation with you or with someone else about it. They're just kind of thinking about their own relationship. Um, and so that's just something that I wanted to say that I was really grateful for that review when it came out. Um, also, I think it takes a special person and poet to be interested in the book that won a contest you were a finalist for. I was very like touched that I wasn't blacklisted from Elise's life after that. Um, and that I got to read her book later um, too. So it all worked out. Um, I think, so what I'm gonna do is uh, I guess I'm going to read one poem from Luxury Blue Lace, which I wasn't planning to, but I'll just read the last poem, which I've been thinking a lot about um, as I work on some new stuff. And then I'll read from my daily actions. I came up with a kind of arbitrary, pseudo arbitrary process to pick poems tonight that I'll walk you through. Um, and then depending on how long I talk in between those, maybe I'll read one new poem at the end. Um, so this is just the last poem from Luxury Blue Lace, which is also a prose poem. Um, so everything's a prose poem tonight. You were trying to find the line and its cease. Had you made the decision or was it made for you? There are many rooms and you suffer most when you go between them. A tendency even in language to uninhabit. But now we know there are rooms. We know it is the going from one to the other that takes it out of you. Blue room into blue room. If only facts would move forward, ellipses without elision, only gap. Where the skull meets the neck, feeling gathers as a grounding stone. Soak it in salt water, warm it in your hands. Let it settle your flickering form, rough outline. Return it to that sub-occipital space just like back here, a center or one of them, a knowledge, the stone's river or the river in your spine. Even the ocean is evaporating where it lies exposed. Um, could y'all hear me okay during that test run? Yeah, perfect. So uh, I've been thinking about this over the past kind of two weeks, there've been a lot of these tweets that are like, I'm looking for poems about X, where X is, you know, many different kinds of things. And I've been kind of too shy to be like, me. <laughs> uh, and so one of the things that I did today is that I sort of went through them and I was like, okay, what are the things that have been like in the world that I've been like, I think my book is kind of about that. Um, and so there were seven different categories that I was like, I think my book is maybe fits into this in some way, uh, which kind of surprised me because my worry when I was first writing this book was that it was too insular. Um, so the seven things that I was like, okay, maybe um, were like space, like houses or apartments as, as kind of a form, um, questions about representation in media, uh, depression or like being depressed as kind of like a bodily stance, um, daily writing, gender transition, 
prose poems. Um, and then this question about climate change as whether or not it's here or coming and this kind of negotiation between them. Um, and so most of the books and most of the poems in my daily actions don't have titles. Um, they're little prose poems. And so I'm just gonna kind of read through them um, in roughly that order of those categories, uh, which I think for me was an interesting exercise because um, yeah, these poems are really kind of uh, leaky, I think, that they do this strange thing where they are sort of individual poems, but I wrote them together. And so they kind of overlap in this way. Um, and so it was interesting to kind of, I, when I was thinking about these categories that maybe they might fit. Um, yeah, and in the Q&A later, I'm happy to talk about structures versus individual poems versus whatever um, as we go. Okay. The shadow of a hair as it grows longer unfurls into the leg of a praying mantis. No one sleeps and we are already dead. We are accepting this or I'm trying to do so without giving up. If the prism scatters, still we hold each color together until we reach a new surface. There are no excuses. A book I read telegraphs the truth of an experience or one truth in a real kind of realism like perfumed hair, a speculative moth under the moon, a speculative tulip bulb which grows into other kinds of bulbs, Edison's, scientists, Multi-purpose latex has been engineered to grant you vision in the dark, even if you did not have vision in the light. I am happy for this vision of a life, but wish for a transformation instead. I have never read a book that mirrored my gender and like books anyway. Is it unnecessary then, or is there an absence that, if filled, would flood? Again, I understand calm as an absence. I understand repression as an absence still filling the lungs with water. Um, that's the poem on page 16. I'll sort of give you page numbers. I forgot to do that beforehand. So if you want to follow along, you can. The next one is just two pages later on 18. The TV filters from the other room. Are private feelings really public? A closed question. The way that therapists say things you'd expect you'd exactly expect them to say, and they become profound. Like, just because everyone dies doesn't mean you must outrun their death. Or social pressures affect me even when I am alone. I realize there's a window open even though the air conditioner is on, but it's cool in my bed, so I don't get up to close it. I lay motionless for several hours, but do not sleep. Remember my friend who found it easy to become a stone? We are lying here, spraying ourselves down, praying desperately to slide si sideways to the river. This is on 19, the facing page. I have not become a lion, a wolf, not even a lizard. I have been ineffective. I wanted to be a starfish hurtling through a void. All that's left is detritus fused together like the island of trash in the Pacific. Like that island, these two retain importance. I just can't figure out how to tell you. Importance can take us in many directions. What if I said I came from the future and the world had ended, and it was important to write down how your mind collided with itself? What if I said I grayed up below the surface, woke only to see the fires cross the fire break? I am not describing my day well, but I'm not trying to escape it either. Um, one of the questions that I think about a lot from this book that I talk to people about it is this question about whether or not it's stream of consciousness or something about whether or not it's just, um, I think about that a lot, mostly because, mostly because of um, uh, which I use a lot when I'm talking and which appears, I don't think anywhere in this book, uh, as a way to say that it's not stream of consciousness. And so I'm like interested in the, in like what we're describing when people say, and I say too sometimes that it's associative or stream of consciousness, that there's, that there's this quality of the movement maybe in it um, where, you know, I don't, 
I don't necessarily want a reader to be like, I know every answer to every piece of this poem. I'm really interested in that kind of, this is what I think the prose poem is really good at. This kind of, it has its own momentum. It kind of unfurls regardless of whether or not you are going with it. Um, and so you can experience kind of the things that stick out to you as it moves um, rather than just, rather than in other kinds of poems, you know, I think for good reason, you're, you're, you move the poem kind of like you get to the end of the line and then you go to the other line and you keep going. Um, and the prose poem kind of picks up its own momentum. Have you forgotten about my body, its particulars? The implication here is that I did somehow successfully. And then I didn't sleep well and my eyes felt more particular while everything else blurred. The window clicks shut. I do this as a routine. When we don't lock it, the top falls down like a blouse and spiders get in that easily. I feel little remorse but wonder. I still could not take it lightly that people made love without me. I misremember that quote. A hanger falls from the chandelier like a raven. Sulfur. I turned my attitude up to confuse you and it worked. I am here and here is the sand I removed to make a space. Um, so that's on 24. So those are all in the kind of the first chunk. And the last two I'm going to read are from this, I think, are in the second half of the book. Um, the book has kind of this first poem and then a big chunk of prose poems and this kind of like, I think of it as like a thin <laughs> center poem um, that that breaks up these kind of prose pieces and then it returns to the prose form. form. Um, and so this is the poem on 43, which is actually the first poem I wrote for the book um, when I wrote it on my phone a long time ago when I was tired of, uh, I felt like I couldn't write, I was like writing the same poem on the computer. Every time I tried to do it on the computer, they like looked the same in this way. And so I tried to write it on my phone, um, which did some different stuff to it. So this is the, you know, the doesn't look quite the same as it did then, but this is the, the poem that came out of the first thing I tried to write for this book. The eye is greedy, a faint glow at the edge of a bed. It is rising like the night sky. It cannot cease. When I removed my mask, nothing looked like I'd been to the club. When I removed my mask, I knew time was up, at least for me. Also, this was before COVID, so the mask, you know, feels differently. Impossible venture until it happens. The balloon inflates into a meteor. California slides partially into the ocean. I wished for overlapping circles as representations of the parts of my life. I wished for an avatar to move through the world looking however I wished it to. It may have been granted in some small part. It fell upon him, will fall. I blamed my curtains for my insomnia, but then the fan on the ceiling shook itself loose, popped the window open and rain flooded in. A daffodil I seem to have dropped on my way home. How intensity fades or collects on a spinning blade. Uh, okay, one more from the book and then one short new one, just to give us an arc for the old poem, book poems, new poem. Um, so this is on 49. And this is the poem, uh, you know, in the list of things, this is the like, is climate change already here or not poem? Because I think the, vo the book is often kind of fantasizing about the oncoming nature of it. Um, and this is the poem that I think when I was kind of working in revisions and stuff, I was like, oh, but it's also addressing this kind of like, the future is not that it's not here. The future is like that it's not, there are different ways that it happens to different people like that in time that it's organized differently. I am trying not to research anything consciously, but this is also an excuse. Baby animals filter through. Dana, the earth is in pain and we can feel it. I worry we are talking about the impending ecological disaster instead of the current one. I worry we are talking about the impending ecological disaster instead of, hello? The hello delay. I don't know to what this concept refers. It is perhaps a technological concept that is also a poem. I speak microphone and one appears. 
I tell myself I still have muscle memory for the instruments of my youth. This time, a glass rose. In one scholarly field, there's a mantra, the more produced, the fewer individual examples that survive. Another mantra of my grandmother's, what's very expensive should not bear a brand. But also such a vacancy might indicate the opposite, an opening. Um, okay, so, oh, I just realized we're at 15. Okay, well, I'm just gonna read a really short. Oh yeah, you're fine. You started a little late. Um, uh, so this poem is called Cloud Study. In my new book, I'm, in my first two books, I was very like, don't say the thing, like do the thing, enact the thing. And now I'm writing all these poems that maybe do that, but are also like, what if we philosophize a little bit? Um, yeah, cloud study. In the cold morning, I hear seagulls, though we are far from the sea. The way the shower before I step in sounds as if music I can only just hear is playing under it. Slowly the dream unfurls from its stuck to my spine. The way I remember my thirst once I take a first sip from the tap. Metaphor holds feeling at a distance, but across distance, I begin to know it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. And uh, for folks who are interested, um, their latest collection, My Daily Actions or the Meteorites is available from Fordham University Press. It was selected by Kathy Park Hong as part of the Poets Out Loud series. And their first uh, collection, Luxury Blue Lace is available from Autumn House Press and was selected um, by Richard Sykin for the, I think, 2018 Rising Writer Prize. Is that the right date? Yeah, the right year. Um, so please check out their work. Um, and also they have wonderful um, trailers uh, for their work um, it, on their website as well, which, which is really fun. And we've taken a look at those. So um, those have been really fun to watch. Um, so we're gonna move ahead uh, to Simone Savannah. Um, I'm not quite sure if the tech issues in the Clarion office where Caroline is were worked out. I'll check in, were those worked out? Are they able to ac access the sound now? Still can't hear. Okay, since the audio for the office isn't working, um, Caroline had shared her introduction with me. Um, and that, so I will read uh, Caroline's, I will do my best Caroline imp uh, impression. Um, and introduce uh, Simone Savannah because tech issues happen um, and we're still able to hear Caroline's wonderful words about you. Recently in poetry writing, we have had the honor of reading Simone Savannah's book, Uses of My Body. With themes of feminism, family, and race, the book was a hit with the class. Tonight, Simone Savannah is here to share her work with the Brevard College community. Simone Savannah, PhD, is a Black feminist writer and teacher born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. She is the author of Uses of My Body and Like Kansas. She is the winner of the Barrow Street Poetry Book Prize chosen by Jericho Brown. Her work has been published in Apogee, The Femme, Powder Keg, Glitter Mob, Shade Journal, Breakbeat Poets, and several other journals and anthologies. She earned her master's in education and BA from Ohio University. She holds a PhD in creative writing from the University of Kansas. She is currently teaching and writing as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cincinnati. In her book, Uses of My Body, Savannah shows what it is like being a black woman. For instance, in After the Gym, she uses the lines, I remember the time a white woman looked me up and down while I was getting dressed in the gym's locker door. The poem Body in the Locker Room uses the lines, tie their coarse black hair in knots. She asks if, I, if, she, asks if she can touch it. Another common topic referenced quite a bit is Savannah's mother. The poem When My Mother Was Decay brings people to tears. 
And we had a very difficult discussion in class <laughs> with that poem. She uses lines like, on the day of her death, the actual day, I watched my mother die for a while. This is a line that brought me to tears, but there are many other lines in this poem that are simply beautiful. Simone Savannah's book, Uses of My Body, is a great book that I fell in love with. And side note, uh, Caroline likes to tell me about her Discord community and whatever collection we're reading in class, she'll read aloud poems. Uh, to her Discord uh, community, and I know they've been really loving uh, hearing your work. I hope everyone out there also falls in love with this amazing book. Now, please join me in welcoming Simone Savannah. Oh, that introduction almost brought me to tears. <laughs> I had to hold back. Thank you so much, Caroline. We had a, a wonderful conversation last week. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for having me. Oh. I love her. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to read. Um, and also, Sam, that was that was wonderful. Like I'm writing this new collection and I'm giving myself permission to write the prose poem now. I've been playing with it, but now it's time. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to actually read after the gym. I wasn't planning on it, but we'll, we'll do that. Um, just so that we have something connected to the introduction. After the gym. Tonight, I ran two miles at the gym then went to see the weed man. He is a tall, white, lanky thing who packs a fourth into a Ziploc bag for me. I think he is sexy because he moves slowly and looks me in the eyes when he takes my cash. I smile at him and imagine us fucking. I think I must like white men too. Tonight I am sitting in the middle of my bed surrounded by crystals. I believe I am a witch living off moons and vibrations, smoking the purple he gave me, running back Alice Walker lines. I think maybe it will piss God off if I don't notice myself too, the way my thighs have come to look like an athlete's thighs. I remember the time a white woman looked me up and down while I was getting dressed in the gym's locker room. She said, I must have always been this thin and pretty. She joked how she keep her man from me if he were still alive. Tonight, I remember that I used to dream of only dancing and the way a leotard might fit me now or even jazz shoes. I've wanted to be a famous woman. Books written about the use of my body. Now I'll move on to um, a longer piece uh, when my mother was decay. <laughs> On the morning of her surgery, my mother picked me up from my cousin's house and gave me Oreos, a parting gift. As if she knew she was going to die, but she didn't die immediately. That day, my family and I saw her new body, still large and brown and her eyes still big, sleepy and numb from the anesthesia. We had expected the surgery to work right away. We did not expect her to stay in the hospital for seven months, for her ankles to swell, the medical socks, the smell of decay and open blisters and gauze when her left breast turned rock solid and black. We did not anticipate the amputation, her long breasts as removable, the use of skin from her thigh to cover the phantom complication of fleshy white. My mother told us she wanted her flesh gone, her stomach the size of an egg, her thighs gaping and her body so slim and tender it would slide from the bone. When instead her body began to loosen, when her skin began dragging slow and dry and cracking at the incisions, she still laughed, squealed and opened her mouth so wide the wind knocked her head back. And yes, the men still came. They weren't particular about bodies or death or hospital beds. On the day she died, they all showed up demanding to be her husband on paper. T reasoned he was the last to fuck her, but we chose my stepfather because he was the last to give her children. My mother said she would die when she was 36, but she was actually 37. So we delayed the wake and built a casket that would fit her still large body. 
We dressed her in white and sewed her eyes shut so the medicine wouldn't leak and disturb the congregation. The mortician also said we needed to buy a, a sock to stuff her bra and gloves to hide her blistered hands. We buried my mother's body eight days into September in the soil of a cemetery on 17th Avenue and ate soul food in the basement of the church and some at my grandfather's house where he showed me a picture of my birth grandmother dead at 37. And he said she was crazy, had drank herself into a closet to break and die alone. He said he was sorry he had given Tracy up. His limp and his heart were too heavy to help carry her casket, but he remembered holding my mother the day she was born. On the day of her death, the actual day, I watched my mother die for a while. I held her hands beneath the blankets in ICU while my aunt sung to her. They told her she could let go and go home if she wanted. When the doctor said she had less than an hour, I looked at the clock above her head and back at the blood seeping out of her nose and ears. My eldest brother and I left her body with my aunt at the hospital. Still large, now shuddering, like she had just begun to fear the decay. On the day of my mother's death, the actual day, we faced the hot August Sunday from the porch where my brother said it was all fucked up, real chicken breast and carved the round shape of her face into my grandparents' wooden stairs. He left the porch for a swisher and soda and returned with cookies. I thought she wouldn't die at all. But after my aunt called and after my stepfather came home with her things, her gown, the OSU hospital cup with her lipstick on the tip of the straw, it became true. So I'll read some, some exciting poems, not, not so sad. Um, now I'll go back to one of my first pieces I was published, um, Like Want for Having. Sometimes it's the yellow spot of bananas on my refrigerator that make me think of you. Not for your touch or for the chocolate, but because of the time you went to work and left me at your place said that if I got hungry, I could have anything I wanted. I thought if you had bananas, I would crump dance in your kitchen. But no, you did not have bananas. So ate your peanuts and drank your last bottle of water. Thought about how you said I could have anything. I wondered if hunger is why women get married, not for the bananas, but for the company and for the having of absolutely anything. I wonder now if hunger is why men send me strange messages about how they want to spit in my throat or call me baby or sweetheart and ask me to say what I want to do with their dicks in my tongue. I have only wanted to eat you and write bananas and sometimes only want you and I dancing in your living room, taking shots of Red Bull in 1800. Like you have no idea, I conjured you. I have a little running list of pieces. So I'll read the sister piece for this poem. I'm back in Ohio now. And so I'll give a little glimpse of some of my Ohio poem as well. Like the time for one thing, Ohio. Sometimes I'm lying across my couch in Kansas texting you. I want to do the things we used to do. Like the time I came home and met you in a hotel after your sister's wedding, where you said you missed me, that I never stay in Ohio long enough, and asked why I stopped eating at Waffle House with you. Mostly I said I wanted a different body. Mostly you said, you said you'll always want me. Even when you're married, you'll still fuck with me. Like the time you spent a week with me in Kansas watching Star Trek and episodes of Cosmos, my body mostly in the smoke in your hands. Though you have a woman in Ohio, you tell all 10 years we've been just friends or too close for her to know the difference. I like never having to birth your children or really put up with you. Though I do want to ask, 
why do you want me so much, but not at all? I am not a good woman. I still want you to do what you used to do to me. All right, I'll read just two more. My mother's birthday is next month, so I'll put some, some more energy out there for her. Years after you die. It's kind of weird, death and birth, but we'll get to it. <laughs> Years after you die. <laughs> My father told me that a man kicked you in the stomach once. It was hard enough to put you in the hospital where he told you he wanted to put a bullet through the man's head once he found him. He said he even tried to break down your door, banged at it for you so hard the neighbors called the police. He had to hide somewhere in an alley in the dark all because he thought some other man was up there with you. He was always with you, even when you were with someone else. My stepfather, for instance, whom he is angry with for having babies with you while he was away in prison. You were once a security guard, but a home man broke you again and again. The man you sold dope for broke you. My grandfather broke you. My sister's fathers broke you. My brother's fathers broke you. The doctors broke you open. There was something you wanted taken out of you, I think. Something as quick as the breath. You gave birth so many times, it is easy for you to die. In April, I visited your mother's grave. I know you went looking for her in Cleveland the year after I was born. Your mother's grave is mostly brown grass. There was no headstone to identify her or to say how long she lived or had been dying. The attendants put out a purple flag with her name and plot number that I took home and placed next to a photo of you. Do you wonder what she thinks of you now, dead too? Your daughter looking for you, for some garden of yours. Do you think she say something about the way men tell stories now that her body has settled in hard ground? Or about how much she ached and ached? I don't know if she actually ached. I know something must have driven her crazy the way they say she went crazy. You and I could be sisters how long we've been without our mothers. All right, and I'll just read one more. I'll read. I have a longer list, and I'm like, what do I read now? It's always hard to follow a, a sad poem. <laughs> Bloom time. Mostly I lied to my therapist when he asked if I had ever thought about being unfaithful to the woman I was with. I mean, how do I say to this mindful ass white man, I'm a bad woman too, or I'm not so good at being good to anybody. In other words, I cheat on niggas because they deserve it. When I told my best friend I did it because the relationship was heavy, a trauma I'd never imagined carrying, and I just wanted some whole ass shit popping in my apartment again, he said, welcome back, welcome back. You a bad bitch, beloved. You can have anything you've wanted. I said, you're right, you're right. I didn't leave her immediately, but I did leave. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone, for that reading. Um, and for doing some last minute set adjustments <laughs> for, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Sam, as well. We're gonna move into a Q and A portion. I of course always have a thousand questions I could ask, but I would really love folks in the audience to ask questions. Uh, feel free to type a question in the chat if you'd like. Um, that way, if there's a glitch on Zoom, it's there for, and it's there for everyone to read. Um, so I will give folks a moment to, um, write up some questions in there and I can read them aloud or if someone would like to read their own question aloud, they're more than welcome to do so. Um, but I'll get started. I'll start with one question and then hopefully folks will, will ask their own. Um, so this is 
kind of for both of you. Um, so the theme of our poetry uh, writing class this semester is thinking about embodiment um, in poetics. And so the collections that I chose really focus on embodiment and the bodies in, in particular ways. So how do you view um, the work in these collections and even other work you're doing now as um, commenting on or um, moving towards the body or embodiment? Okay, I go. <laughs> um, so my the, my the title of my work is Uses of My Body. So, um, and I, I borrowed that title from Audre Lorde's essays, um, Uses of the Erotic and Uses of Anger. And really what I wanted to accomplish in these poems was um, thinking about how we're, you know, we're shifting this gaze of sexuality, of womanhood, um, and then how I'm going back to um, embody those erotic acts. So, um, Again, I'm constantly in my body. I'm constantly thinking about it, whether I'm going to the gym or um, or doing whatever I'm doing or, or looking at the people the way that people look at me. And so again, it was really important for me to to think about that in these poems and comment on on my body, but also to think about um, like black feminist thought and what 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 black feminist thought has to say about literature and women who are writing about the body and then make sure I'm doing the same thing in my work. Um, and the other thing is I'm um, just being a performance poet and spoken word artist there too. I feel like um, some of the things I'm doing in my work is, 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 is always a part of me and a part of my physical. And so uh, I'm having to not only embody feminism and um, that gaze on the page, but also thinking how I'm doing that um, through my, my performance work as well. Um, yeah, I think I have, I would say similar things to what someone just said at a lot of levels. Um, but I mean, my first book was very kind of interior in this way, like I really had a very deeply, like individual question, which has a lot of downfalls as like Simone was just talking about, right, you're kind of negotiating this question. And so in this, in this most recent book, um, I feel like suddenly my poetry was like had this awareness where it was like really thinking about like you know what systems is it a part of um and so that's bodily it's, it's other things but it's also bodily but the the one thing that for some reason this is the first thing i thought of when you asked this question elise um is this book that i read a long time ago about tech history and like the history of um like technology and the and this kind of and it was about the and basically the the part, the idea was that there's this fantasy of, of disembodied knowledge that's never true. That like knowledge always is material. That we think about like Wi-Fi, you know, kind of moving all this information through the air. But that really, that this is a, uh, that this is a metaphor that we use to understand or to sell something that's not true actually for how it works. Um, and I don't totally, you know, I'm not a tech person in that way. I couldn't run it down for you. But what I what I thought about when you asked that question and then when Simone was talking was that like one of the things that I've, about embodied knowledge is that we're un it's that everything is embodied and so we're undoing this kind of like fantasy right this like you know Western often like long running idea that somehow anything could exist outside of us um, and so it's really like for me I, yeah that was the first thing I thought of this idea that like everything is embodied which feels so hard to get to because there's so much invested in stuff in knowledge or experience not being embodied. Um, that was a more, you know, I have a kind of personal answer to like Simone said, but that was, uh, that was something that I was thinking about that maybe our work tonight came at that question in different ways, um, but it, they both were really trying to think about that question in some ways, I think. Yeah, I, I love that response and it makes me, um... It just made me think of Matt Bell's recent novel, Apple Appleseed, um, where the, um, I don't want to spoil too much, where this, um, the kind of villain character wants to live forever. Um, but at the end, this character is kind of living off of nanotechnology, like as a consciousness, and, and that even fails. Um, so it just makes me that, that comment on technology about this idea of perpetual existence or trying to escape embodiment is still still fails um, even within um, right the idea of the the technology um, 
And James has um, an awesome question. Um, and so he asks, how do you think the books as a corpus, a body, or as an extension of the body? So like these books you have here. <laughs> That's such a good question. <laughs> so I was, I was just thinking, I always get this question, um, or I guess I was just thinking more about why I write so personally um, along with that. And I think some of these poems, of, of course, are an extension of my actual physical body. Again, you see me in the gym, you see me observing, um, you see other people going on my body, et cetera. Um, but that they also, in some ways, are not me. There, there, there's this truth or these observations that I had in those moments or when I was in my 20s, <laughs> you know? Um, and so there are still these extensions and, and very truthful extensions, but I think over time, they, it, it loses that connection. Like I'll go back and read some of these pieces and I'm like, I'm no longer thinking that way or I no longer feel that way physically. Um, and there was something else I wanted to say about, oh, the poem was about my mother. Um, those are the poems that I feel like I connect to more um, and, and maybe I'm answering if these poems are an extension of the, of the self in some way. So um, going back and forth between being connected to these elegies and just writing them and then also reading them and feeling that very emotional response um, to, you know, thinking about my mother and her death. Um, so I think in that way, the, the book is an extension of my emotional self or this, this very reflective self of all the experiences that I've been, been through. Um, I try my best to, so the, the cover is actually a um, replica of, um, I'm losing her name, Flojo, the <laughs> fastest woman in the world. And so I had, um, her go in and repaint this picture so that it had my hair and my nails, although Flojo also shared the same, um, I guess, style as far as nails and color and, and outfits and things. So uh, I guess in that way, I wanted the book to really say, this is me, This is these are my experiences as a black woman. They don't, um, they may speak to other black women's experiences, but this is very particular to who I am. Again, no matter how much time has passed, um, yeah. Yeah, I think this idea that like the book, I feel like, yeah, the book is a body, but it's in a body. It's a body in that way that like, it's not, it's like partially yours, but mostly it's like not. Like, <laughs> the book exists, like the book exists as this object. I'm just thinking about like, when I opened the box <laughs> of the books, it's like yeah. very bizarre to experience yourself sort of replicated um, into the different copies of the book when you see them together. But it also, I, I think, it's it can be it's kind of helpful um, in understanding how poems work to like see them. Yes. This poem that you felt very intimate about, or that I felt very intimate about, like in this book that has my name, that's also not me because it does for me. It changed how I thought about that circulation. So like the book is sort of like a body, or it, we you know there's like a long history of whatever our books being made out of like human skin and stuff <laughs> in the medieval ages. So there are all these kinds of like overlaps that are useful, but. Um, yeah, but for me, I was like, oh, it's interesting because I can do, like, you can do different things, like, because it's, it's related to me, but it's not my corpus, um, like, other stuff can happen, and so I'm sort of, like, in a relationship with my book um, in this way, um, yeah, which, um, for, but for me, what, where I feel like my body is most closely related to the poem is, like, when I'm picking forms, and I'm writing the poems, and I'm trying to, because that does feel very, like, you know, I'm reading aloud, like someone was saying about thinking about performance and I'm, and I'm shaping in this way that feels like, you know, I'm not always spending every day kind of manifesting my body in the world, but I, um, but there are so many things about that in which you make decisions about what you eat or what you, you know, if you're going to the gym that even if they're not only about what's it going to do to your body, they have this kind of angle to them. And I think that poems share that you know, in a productive way, this kind of like thinking about shaping or thinking about how it will move or how it will circulate or something. Um, yeah. That's great. Thinking about movement. We were talking about movement actually today in poetry. I feel like there's so many wonderful intersections with the conversation here and that I've, we've been having in the classroom. I think we have time for one more question. 
So I will pause for awkward silence and stare at all of the photos or names <laughs> of the screen to, to prompt a question because I know folks had questions and maybe they'll ask them later, but I wanted to give the chance now. Oh, the, um, Caroline and, and the crew at the Clarion, book recommendations, what you're reading, any good books to read or recommend? Mm, I'm actually reading um, Roxane Gay's um, memoir or Hunger, a memoir of my body, which is so strange to be reading, um, especially because I'm, I'm, again, I'm constantly thinking about my relationship to my body and eating and fitness and to go to someone else's relationship is sort of pulls me out of my own thinking to, to be aware of everyone else's perspective. Um, but I'm reading that, I'm, a, I'm getting ready to reread. Uh, and if, if you ever read Edwidge Danticott, just have a box of tissues next to you because Lord, it gets that way. But I'm rereading um, Edwidge Danticott and then um, I'm forgetting um, Danica Kelly's uh, name of her collection, but I'm reading as well, but yeah. The Renunciations. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, yes. Um, yeah, what am I reading? I feel like my reading has been really wonky this year because I went down this like, I was reading all this old modern dance criticism from like the mid century and like learning about the history of American concert dance. So, um, but I don't know that I recommend that for someone who's like not interested in, in the um, concept, although I have a lot of thoughts about different critics from like the fifties to the eighties now. Um, last year, the two poetry books that I read that were sort of like the books that I loved the most um, were a book called Diamonds by Camille Guthrie. Um, which I just think is kind of brilliant. And it's thinking about like humor. Poetry is like so rarely funny. And this book I thought was like so funny without sacrificing any of the other kinds of emotional capabilities of poetry. Um, and then um, Carly Ingram's uh, The Animal Indoors, um, which is also on Autumn House, which published my first book um, and which one I live in Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh has a center for African-American poetry and poetics and they're in the beginning stages of like the second or third year of a book prize that they run. Uh, and Carly's book won that prize last year. And that book also similarly like is kind of funny, um, but it's also kind of like sarcastic or ironic in this really like kind of surprising way. Like it can be very straightforwardly political and it can also be very intimate and I, spent half the time when I was reading this book, like, because it does both of these things so well, unsure which one it was doing sometimes. I would be like, wait, where is the, when is this poem serious? Um, but not in a way that made me feel like I was out of the, you know, it was like left in the cold, like that this book was interested in these, you know, very dominant questions about authenticity and like sincerity and how do you perform certain kinds of identity categories. Um, and it played with them in a really kind of interesting way. That's my two poetry book. Well, those are some wonderful recommendations. And to reiterate from our first um, Visiting Writers uh, series reading uh, with Han Vanderhart and Eric Tran, um, as, as both of them said, read widely, read, read, yes. and, and read some more. Um, so anytime anyone can give you book recommendations, take them. Um, I definitely was scribbling uh, some down. Um, and we look forward uh, to discussing, um, you know, wrapping up our discussion of Simone Savannah's working class and then just getting into uh, Sam's work uh, this week over the next few weeks. Um, but I'd like to thank everyone again for attending this evening. And I know we've all been through a lot of Zoom readings over the last few years, but it, it's such a delight to be able to connect with you all this way and also to connect writers I really admire together. I think, is this the first time both of you have read together? That's, well, that's wonderful. Um, so it's really wonderful and fun to pair up writers um, who I, whose work I think resonates in really interesting ways. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, we'll conclude our second event for the um, West Lecture Series and Visiting Poets and Writers Series. 
thank you everyone for coming. And next week, Monday, uh, March 21st, we are hosting virtually Latanya McQueen, um, whose novel, When the Reckoning Comes, um, came out this past year. And, and if you love uh, Southern Gothic horror um, set on a plantation that has been renovated to be a tourist attraction and wedding venue, um, you can imagine what might happen um, in that novel. So we really look forward to having her next week. And then our two other writers coming up April 4th, Molly McCauley Brown will be visiting us virtually um, as part of the Brevard College Common Read Program. And then on Thursday, April 14th in person, we will have essayist and poet Caroline Crew um, coming to campus. So please tune in for those events and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>